Hi, everyone. My name is Prem Prumser, and I'm one of the founders uh, and the CEO of Miramis Incorporated. And thank you for tuning in um, to this talk, and I'm going to be speaking about some of the new molecular diagnostics that have come about for COVID-19. So this first slide here um, that I'm showing you is really the initiative that came out from our company Miramis uh, through you know, our community efforts around COVID-19 in response to, you know, what was going on in our surrounding areas. So we founded this um, mobilizing foundation, and, you know, that's where a lot of the research is taking place, and so that's what I'm presenting to you here, um, but also in conjunction with my company, Miramis. So I think, you know, we all know what's going on right now throughout the world, the globe. Um, a virus called SARS-CoV-2, you know, it's causing the disease COVID-19, and it's spreading across the globe. Uh, in waves, you know, in, in different phases and different times throughout the globe. And I think since December 19th, uh, sorry, December 2019, there have been, you know, more than really uh, 136 million confirmed cases and uh, the number of, of recorded deaths up to nearly 3 million. Of course, that's only recorded deaths and we do always believe that there's, you know, more deaths than recorded. So, you know, you and anywhere you've been in the world, you would know that it's caused some shutdowns to travel, to commerce, to public schools, um, public spaces, and really our way of being and our way of life, uh, which is interacting with each other. So it's it's been super devastating to everyone, and particularly um, in New York, where, you know, it really hit first in the U.S. Um, very hard. So there are vaccinations occurring, you know, throughout our nation and, and the world slowlier than we would like to, um, but also vaccinations are not yet available for children under the age of 16. Uh, and its cases are still continuing to rise and there are still people being infected despite vaccination. Um, and it will take a quite a long time for, you know, the globe to be up to 60 to 80 percent vaccinated. So the mortality rate is going to continue um, and is estimated to be far more deadly than influenza. And so, you know, without um, universal robust um, vaccinations across the world, we really do have to continue testing to continue to curb transmission rates. And that's the key to molecular diagnostics, which I'll be talking to you about. In the beginning of the pandemic, um, my company is located in the SUNY Downstate Technology Incubator. And so I was drafted in to help coordinate efforts there and really analyze the immune response in the patients, um, you know, looking at their antibody profiles to see, you know, which patients were having those antibodies that were neutralizing. And so you can see, you know, we really were creating these um, assays when no commercially available reagents were were yet available for sale. So we had to actually generate them in our own lab um, and utilize them to do antibody profiling. So we had, unfortunately, uh, in the hospital, um, too many patients and too many patient samples that we were inundated with. And so we were taking their blood samples and, and profiling the antibodies there. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of what we've learned here. Um, so, you know, as we know, um, SARS CoV-2 is, is a coronavirus, and it is a common cold, and it has different structural features, right? So there, and it's got the name due to its structure that looks like a crown. Uh, and so, you know, most of the proteins that are antigenic are listed here. Um, the spike protein uh, on the outside of the, um, the outer shell, the membrane protein, the nucleocapsid, and the envelope as well. So, you know, this is common knowledge that, you know, viruses cannot replicate on their own. They do require a host. And so we are, have become that host. It has jumped from presumably bats to possibly a civet um, and then into humans. But again, all of this is still truly unknown of the actual origins of this virus. But um, we do have in this virus the, the proteins that I discussed. And the key of these is to recognize them as the antigens that we can utilize to um, then detect virus within our cells, right? So, you know, what do these structures do for the virus? Well, it's now known that, you know, we humans, we have a what's called our ACE2 receptor, and, and they're located on, the, on many different cell types, actually, universally throughout our body, but primarily in our um, epithelial pathways from the lungs to our intestines and so forth, they're highly, highly expressed. So it gives the virus um, a really vast opportunity to bind any one of these receptors on our cells and enter that way. And so that's what the virus does. It uses its spike 
um, S protein to bind our ACE2 receptor and then internalize and hijack our machinery to then um, replicate. And so, you know, as I've said earlier, ACE2 receptors are really abundant in the intestine, the heart, and the kidney. So what happens when a virus infects us? Well, you know, there's the fast response and then there's the longer response and then the long-term response. So the fast response is this um, innate immune response over here on the left that I'm showing, which happens within days of our body recognizing it's been infected by some foreign invader. And so we start to secrete inflammatory cytokines, um, and that should protect us. It should engage our macrophages or natural killer cells to come in and, and wipe out the cells that have been infected. But oftentimes, um, sometimes these cytokines that can be released from these infected cells can cause uh, can actually secrete too much, and that can lead to what's known now as a cytokine storm, and that can then lead to um, acute respiratory distress if it's imbalanced and there's too much. And so that's a feature of severe disease that we've seen in patients. Um, once that innate immune response is kicked in, we then have our um, adaptive response that kicks in, which is our B cells and our T cells. But first, it's the T cells that get honed in. So the cytokines signal to the T cells and they say, hey, you know, come over to me. I've been infected. Um, we need to build a repertoire of T cells that can then recognize the other cells that have been infected and go around and destroy them. And so this happens about, you know, the first week or so after um, we've been invaded with the virus. The long-term response happens because our T cells then recruit our B cells. And our B cells say, you know, okay, thank you for wiping me out, but I want to create a repertoire of molecules that can circulate throughout my body. And if I'm ever infected again, I can recognize that quickly and destroy it. And so it takes time for those antibodies to build up. Um, and it takes greater than 14 days on average when we're infected. But, you know, oddly enough, with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, we've just seen a an actually prolonged B cell response where it takes even longer than normal to generate these antibodies. And that's something I'll touch into later. So um, in, in terms of diagnostics, um, you know, there are really a few types of testing. I'm only going into the very general details of them. And so, you know, first on what we were talking about were really antibody detection. You know, it was hard um, in the beginning to actually measure if someone had, had had the disease or, you know, has the disease currently and to catch it at that particular time. So we were going around the city looking at their antibodies and trying to understand whether they had had past exposure. So, you know, this is one type of testing for COVID-19 infection, but it can really only tell you if you have a past infection. There are, you know, different antibody responses, your IgM and your IgG. And your IgM is an early response. And, and we were trying to utilize that to say, do we have current infection? But it really was not reliable to do that. So, so antibody detection, you know, ultimately cannot tell you if you have the disease currently. It can really only tell you if you've had past exposure. And then there are two other types of tests that can determine, tell you whether you have a current infection. Um, and so the, you know, gold standard is our nucleic acid amplification test, otherwise known as PCR. And so we can amplify the viral RNA and then measure and determine, you know, what is the viral load. And this is very important to inform infected individuals early on and to try to prevent transmission to others. Um, so uh, the other type of testing is an antigen test. Now this test is going to detect whether we have those, those viral antigens as I've shown you earlier in the diagram of a um, viral particle. And these are great because they're rapid, but because we're not amplifying, it's very, very hard to detect, um, to have any detection until you have very high viral loads. And so in early case of uh, infection, we can really miss um, an infected person by using antigen tests. So that's just something to be aware of. Okay, so, you know, again, just a brief overview of these tests. So. You know, what is the antibody test? Well, the, the most common use test is what's called an ELISA. And so what we do here is we build out and we, we synthesize viral proteins, which are here, um, you know, looking on the right panel, such as the spike protein. And we'll immobilize the spike protein um, that we've generated and synthesized. And then we will um, allow, you know, or put patient serum onto that spike, um, that immobilized spike protein, and we'll see and measure do any antibodies um, bind. 
And in that case, if they do, it does mean that a person has had exposure because they have some type of specific antibodies that will bind that um, spike protein or any actual antigen of the virus that we intend to use. So that's the ELISA and you know, antibody tests come either in the ELISA takes a longer time, but it's it's a much more um, sensitive assay. And then there are some of these what are called lateral flow assays, which are quicker and they can, you know, give you a readout and they much, much, look much like a pregnancy test. And they'll give you a band that will say, yes, I can detect um, antibodies uh, within this blood sample or, or no, I, I don't detect any. On the left-hand side, you know, again, the molecular um, diagnostic test to tell you whether you have and I can detect at this moment in time whether there are any viral RNA particles. So because it's RNA, um, we want to make it stable. So we'll isolate the RNA from the virus, use a reverse transcriptase um, uh, reaction to convert it back to DNA and then make it double-stranded DNA. And then we'll use PCR to, to actually amplify and copy that. And we'll use a probe that will detect any of that amplification so we can measure it in real time and we can see how many actual viral copies do we have. Now, when building out um, molecular diagnostics or assays, you know, we do have to recognize that uh, viruses have similarity to other viruses that we've been exposed to in the past. And so choosing the right actual um, antigen or RNA, you know, sequence um, is going to be important because you, you want to have it to be specific to, you know, SARS-CoV-2 um, and not detect prior infections from another um, related virus. You know, but you also don't want it to have it so specific that you miss it, right? If, if a person isn't making an antibody to that specific region, they may have been exposed, but, you know, you're not detecting that actual prior exposure because, of, you know, you're narrowing it down too far. So it's, it's really important to look at the um, sites and, and analyze, you know, what is specific to other viruses, but where are their uniqueness um, in the virus that I actually want to detect? So the end, the nucleocapsid, it has a, a great identity to other um, coronaviruses, you know, almost 90, 90, greater than 90%. So it's hard to build antibody um, uh, tests off of that, but we can build, um, you know, very specific through sequencing, um, you know, we can build uh, PCR assays to amplify very specific regions to SARS-CoV-2 alone. Um, the same with the S protein, the spike, you know, the, the receptor binding domain does have some very unique features in SARS-CoV-2 that is not seen in other coronaviruses. And so that is particularly used more for the antibody um, tests that we build out. because, And also because those antibodies are thought to be um, the neutralizing ones. They're the ones that when they bind to the spike protein, they can prevent entry into the cell and thus prevent infection. So those seem to be the ones that are critical to measure. So as I mentioned before, um, it seems like, you know, there is some delayed response in SARS-CoV-2, you know, and triggering the immune system to make antibodies. So initially, um, it, it does appear that these mild and asymptomatic cases don't really have a high level of antibodies. That's what we've seen, we've seen throughout when measuring them, um, and, but the severe cases do. So normally we would see IgM this purple peak here, come up somewhere around, you know, four to seven days. But with COVID-19, we're seeing the peaks coming around 10 to even, you know, 14 days. And IgG, we would normally see come up around um, 14 days or so. But actually, in COVID patients, we're seeing them come up actually beyond the third week, so 21 days. And sometimes we never even see IgG until 50 or 60 days post-infection. So it's a really different um, profile. Uh, Kramer, who I'm quoting here, um, his group was really one of the first on Mount Sinai that created this ELISA. You know, we simply took that protocol and built the assay for SUNY Downstate. But again, that's what they've shown is that some people don't show IgG for more than 50 days. So that's why I was telling you antibody testing is not a way to really determine if someone um, has the disease now. Um, you know, lots of publications out there saying that only 5% or so of people may have neutralizing antibodies. So that was early days results. Um, it'd be important to look at, you know, what are some of the new days. But the questions we still have, you know, are really how effective are these antibodies and how long will immunity last? And that is an ongoing question now, um, even with vaccination. How long are the vaccines good for? How often will we need boosters? Will we need boosters to new variants and so forth? And the answer to those are likely yes. Um, one of the critical things that we saw, uh, really, again, I'm going to emphasize is that 
patients that had mild or asymptomatic disease did not show a consistent antibody response. Sometimes we, they really would detect them and then the antibodies would phase very quickly, sometimes six to eight weeks after. And again, it depends what antibodies you were looking at. Um, but with, uh, you know, so with antibody testing, we just knew we weren't going to be able to determine whether or not people have had the disease consistently. Now, there are a lot of antibody tests out there. I'm just showing you some of the few that have been approved um, or authorized by the FDA. And, you know, again, there are various sensitivity levels throughout them and, and false positive rates and so forth. But you can look into that later, and there's some good references that I'll provide. But the question becomes, if we can't reliably tell if someone has had the disease, we need to know if someone has it now. And so we're going to have to perform um, a lot of routine testing, repeat testing. So, um, okay, so again, um, what kind of type of test can tell us if we have COVID now. So there are antigen tests. And as I said, you know, these are um, quick, but they're less sensitive because we're not able to amplify them. So, you know, what is the basic premise of these tests? Well, it's kind of similar to an antibody test, but it's the reverse. What we actually do is create an antibody against SARS-CoV-2. So it's some type of synthetic antibody, and we make that immobile. And then we'll put a patient sample, whether it's, you know, a nasal swab or some type of saliva, and we'll put it on the test. And if there are viral antigens there, it'll bind to the antibodies, the synthetic antibodies we've created, and then you'll get a signal. So you can see here, if there's an antigen, which is highlighted here in green, you'll get that signal. If it's negative, you won't get a signal. So again, looking like a pregnancy test, you'll get a couple of lines um, as a result. So the good thing about these, they can be quick. They can be roughly about 15 minutes or so. Um, a lot of them are point of care. Some are being proved now. And a positive is likely going to tell you you have an active infection. But not only that, you do have high viral loads because, again, the sensitivity of these are not um, very high. But um, it does not tell us, you know, if you're negative, that you don't have COVID. And that's the important thing for people to realize is that this test um, may give a false sense of security because, again, we're not amplifying, so it's less sensitive. So, you know, there are some at home and they can be used um, but, you know, you have to use them repeatedly to know whether or not, in fact, you don't have um, uh, COVID infection. So, you know, this slide here, what I'm showing you is the ab some of the results that came out from a study that was done on, on um, more than 2,500 people using the Abbott Now um, rapid antigen test. And what I'm highlighting in blue here is some really concerning results. Um, it's great if you're symptomatic and your CT value is lower than 25, you can always detect these people. They have high viral load. But once the viral loads start going down, your ability to detect um, using these tests become, uh, you know, it's less um, reliable, less accurate. And what's even more concerning is in children and in adults, you know, looking at the bottom, in an asymptomatic population, uh, you know, you have a 65% sensitivity in children, 70% adults. So you're going to miss roughly one third of all cases and particularly those that are early in the part of infection. Um, okay. So we have to be careful about what type of tests we choose to utilize. Um, you know, let's see here, just putting all this. Okay. So PCR tests, as I've described, these are really the gold standard. We can take a sample, and as I've already told you, to amplify and then detect by some kind of signal. And we can detect not just one gene, but multiple genes at a time to create a multiplex assay that, you know, you're certain this person has an infection. So a positive, you get a positive result, you really do have an active infection. If you have a negative result, it's quite likely high likelihood that you are not infected when the sample is collected. But the problem with um, PCR tests is most of them have to be performed in lab. There are some PCR tests that can be done point of care, uh, but PCR tests do have longer turnaround times than antigen tests. They can be anywhere from less than an hour if you have a machine on site um, to multiple days even. So that turnaround time, you know, is really critical in this. But they really are the most specific um, and most sensitive tests that can be utilized. So some things to think about with all of these tests, okay? How do we really win at COVID-19 molecular diagnostics? The key thing is they've got to be fast, they've got to be cheap, they've got to be easy. So, you know, what are some of the parts of um, that are will inhibit any one of these being fast, cheap, and easy? Well, sample collection types, right? We got to think about that. If we need repeat testing, which of these types that are now currently offered will have higher compliance? I can tell you firsthand a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, nobody likes them. No one's going to volunteer for them. Um, they're very uncomfortable, very invasive, and they require a highly trained um, healthcare professional to administer them. 
so, you know, even though they are the gold standard at this current moment in time, they're very uncomfortable, so they will have low compliance. An anterior nail swab, nair swab is now utilized, and you just have to go to the front of your tip of your nose. You can self-administer, um, but children cannot, so that's one thing. Um, but again, you know, not as sensitive as a nasopharyngeal because people are self-administering can also have some false um, uh, negatives there just through the sample collection. Saliva is is one of the new sample types on coming on, and it's been highly debated about because. You know, as a respiratory disease, we really think of the nasal pharyngeal swab as the gold standard, saliva as the secondary. But I'm going to show you some data that really is in support of saliva. You know, and it's easy. It's spitting in a tube. It has high compliance. It doesn't have to interrupt anyone's day. You know, you can get that done in about 30 seconds. Um, and, you know, and so we found that this type of sample collection really uh, has higher compliance, and that is why we've moved along with that. Now, here's some data that came out. And, um I unfortunately forgot to put the um, citation here, so I'll make sure that that gets put into um, the information that I provide. But this group here out of Cal um, Tech had actually followed cases um, before anyone was infected. So they had to follow many, many people, and, and particularly when someone infected, they went around and looked at siblings and people in the household to catch those that were not infected. And what they show, they, look, they take saliva, they take nasal swabs, and they follow them through. And interestingly enough, that what they show is that saliva has, on average, can detect, um, you, has high virus uh, loads 1.5 to 4.5 days before they could ever detect it in a nasal swab. So, you know, I think this, this slide here shows so much information. You know, you might want to pause and take a look at it because they measure symptoms, they measure um you know, and they're looking and they put on here and plot it out, you know, the limit of detection for antigen tests versus PCR and so forth. And so really showing you that using saliva, um, they can detect an infection days before anyone has symptoms, days before they can even detect it in a nasal swab. So I think it's really critical information that just came out. It was just released, and um, I'll make sure the citation gets up there because that's um, very critical data. And it's not just data they've shown. It's data we have as well in our lab and others have throughout um, the world they're now showing. So that's where we moved forward with that. So I'm going to switch gears now and really show you what our technique is um, because that fast cheap and easy comes into play. And so we thought about that in our mission to spread around rapid testing. We wanted a high quality test um, that was really sensitive for an asymptomatic population to work in as screening. And so you see here um, that that was one of the things. We are doing a lot of school testing, doing surveillance testing. So um, it has to be high throughput, high sensitivity, high specificity, and simple safe collection. So we switched over to saliva. We have a process we call saliva clear. Um, and that is due to the fact that it's a, it's a surveillance method. So this is our, um, our method. And, you know, to make it affordable, uh, what we had done was scour the planet for different types of uh, PCR testing, and we really could only get it down um, to low and increase capacity if we do what's called pool testing. So what we do is we have our community or our school will submit samples, individual samples, and we will, in the lab, take a little bit out from each sample and combine them into make one specimen, which we call the pool specimen. And then we will test that specimen um, like any individual specimen. And if it's negative, which most of them do come back in an asymptomatic population, uh, we can consider all of those um, in that pool negative. If it's positive, we can go back to the original sample and actually just test it down. And we use a different EUA method called Saliva Direct to test them individually. And you can see that we can then identify the individual. So we kind of go from a surveillance to screening to diagnostic method all in one um, using the same sample. And, you know, why we did this is because, again, you know, even if cost was not an issue, we, we needed to maximize our reagents. In the summertime when it took somewhat of 7 to 14 days, depending on where you were, to get a PCR test result back, you know, it was because labs were running out of reagents. So even if costs were not a factor, um, you know, just illustration here of what pool testing can do from you. On the top, you're seeing how many tests you'd have to do if you were doing individual. And on the bottom, you know, if you're just doing pool testing. You know, so we really minimize the number of tests we have to do. And we've shown that this is very effective to minimize costs um, as well as increase throughput within the lab uh, and, and any lab with all of the same basic equipment. So what does this process look like in the lab for us and for others that want to actually implement something? Um, we have these vials that they will submit. They all come with the, 
barcode on the side and on the bottom. So what I'm showing you here on the left, the scan rack, we put all the vials in a um, in a rack and we just scan them at one time, making it very quick. So we have these de these scanners and then um, we actually can decap them as well, rows of eight. So we use an automated decapping machine and then that rack gets moved over to this um, liquid handler to do automated pooling and then that moves back to the decapper to get capped. And, and then those samples then go, you know, once it's pooled, go into these larger pool tubes. And then we rack that pool tube, we rescan them. And now instead of having, say, in a Kingfisher extra RNA automated extraction, having 96 samples, we now have 90, 96 times 24 that we can do. So we really increase the throughput there and, you know, more than 2,000 samples within that one RNA extraction. And then it just moves down the pipeline. We set up our qPCR. Um, through, again, automated machinery and set it into our quant studio to measure um, the viral loads. So that's our process in a nutshell. Um, and most labs have these pieces of equipment and they only need little bits here and there to make it fully automated. Um, so we find that this process works. So, you know, in my laboratory with about two quant studios uh, and, you know, two Kingfishers, our throughput is still more than, you know, 40, 50,000 a day that we can accomplish with this machinery. Um, you know, we just have to maximize personnel. On average, we're doing more than 25,000 a day right now, but we can really scale to go further. Um, what does the data look like coming out of there? Well, if we look here on the left, um, with the, you know, we're using the um, Thermo Fisher Tac Path Combo Kit for saliva. Um, that's what we're using on. And so you can see here looking at, um, viral copies per microliter uh, expressed here. So even below one, you know, even at just half a copy per microliter, or I would say 500 per ml, um, you can see we can still detect it. And then once we go below that, you can see it's, it's a little inconsistent. So that's our level of detection there. It's about 500 copies per ml. Um, but now if we take that sample, um, you know, it, actually if we take samples with five or 10, you can see here in a pooled setting of 24, um, we can always detect one sample um, in a pool of 24. So on the right here, I'm showing you a an individual specimen has either five copies or 10 copies, and we've artificially made pools um, of one, of four, of eight, 12, going all the way up to 24. And you can see 100% of the time, we can always detect um, that one positive sample in that pool. So we're not losing sensitivity there at five copies and at 10 copies up here, but even in a clinical sample, I'm looking at the table below here that has our limit of detection here roughly, you know, right there, right around the 31, 32 CT range. If we take that individual sample and put it in a pool of 24, um, it doesn't change the CT value as much. We can always, again, detect that 100% of the time. So that's, you know, really what it looks like here, um, plotting out what the um, Thermo Fisher combo kit shows you is the three gene detection, the N gene, the S gene, and then the open reading frame 1AB. So we're very confident having done, you know, now over a million samples in our lab and, you know, the positivity rate is consistent with what schools are seeing doing other different types of surveillance um, testing that, you know, we're still seeing roughly about a 0.5% positivity rate in school environment. Um, our lab has been, you know, really mission driven, focusing on the impact that we can make. And we've teamed up with, again, the Yale Saliva Direct team to implement um, this pool to then diagnostic testing. We've done, you know, more than 500 schools from the workplaces. The key thing here is to help us open schools. Uh, you know, that is what our testing protocols utilize for, as we've seen how devastating the closure of schools has been to the communities, to students, to mental health, um, and to families, to parents, you know, and, and myself as a parent, um, I know the hardships of keeping kids at home. So just to wrap up in a couple more slides for you, um, this is our method, but by all means, there are other technologies out there. So I want to highlight a few of them just to give you food for thought. So one of the technologies I really do like, um, you know, it's not as sensitive as a RT-PCR uh, method, but it is more sensitive than a rapid antigen because you are amplifying here. This is what's called RT lamp and it's a loop mediated isothermal amplification. And the difference here from, from RT PCR is that it requires six primers so that what you're amplifying is a loop. And then it's easier to actually amplify this loop at um, a stable temperature. So unlike a RT PCR, which you have to go between 95 degrees to De to denature the, the product and then amplify around 65. Here you can keep it steady at 65 and you can just continuously amplify. 
And so that, um, and that can be achieved in about 40, 30 to 45 minutes. So it can be done point of care even, even just using a water bath. And my lab is trying to figure out how to scale that method, you know, out in the field. But again, keeping in mind, it's not as sensitive as a, as a gold standard RT-PCR, but it is more sensitive than it's kind of right there in the intermeter. So there's other groups that have um, this uh, method and they're utilizing it very cleverly to, um, you know, amplify using RT lamp and then they're adding in CRISPR. So they call this method um, detector. They add this CRISPR method in here um, and they can cleave the product and then give you a signal. So again, using that, what looks like a pregnancy test, um, utilize this method and show do they get cleavage or not and that will determine whether you have viral particles that were amplified or viral RNA that was amplified. Um, another readout of, um, Sorry, I'm trying to push this slide. There it goes, sorry about that. Okay, another readout, um, rather than using the CRISPR method, it's just a color method, right? You can utilize the um, protons in the solution to say whether or not um, you have, um, you know, you're, you're amplifying, right? And so the red will be um, not detected and the yellow, it, it starts to show you that, you know, you, you have a lot of amplification there because of the proton exchange there. And so it's a pH-based readout. And so this is what we call color metric lamp. Um, and again, you need six primers, you throw it into that reaction. And over time, um, you can see that you'll get the change of color from, um, you know, red to yellow and orange being somewhat. So here again, not, as sensitive, but um, you know, here we do have a positive sample here, but not as sensitive. You can see it starts to change over time, right? And so it's the time point. But the one problem with it is that, as you see here, even with no RNA, at 60 minutes, you get a change over that. So there's a critical time at which all of this reactions must be stopped. Um, but you can also use machines to measure that and quantitate it too. So you know, capturing it at different time points and knowing what's there. So those are just some new technologies I'm throwing out there. Um, I need to really thank um, my team. Um, we've quickly grown. Uh, oh, sorry, this is just another read out there. But um, my team here has really quickly grown. We're, we're even beyond this um, to accomplish all of this in our lab. And uh, thank you, the audience, for tuning in, listening in, and hopefully um, you've learned something a little bit more about COVID molecular diagnostics today. Thank you.